So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Mabel Lamb. I'm with the Sherman Park Community Association. And tonight we are having one of our fabulous eco webinars. And we'd like to uh, showcase uh, what our residents are doing here in the community. We're going to make some applesauce and talk a little bit about how to put your garden bed to rest. But in the meantime, and between time, before we start that, I wanted to share with you a couple events that are coming up um, in the Sherman Park community. Um, I don't know if you all can see this. Um, mm -hmm. There is the Sherman Park Home Tour. Um, it's our annual home tour and scavenger hunt this Sunday on October 22nd from 1 until 4 p.m. And you can purchase your tickets on Eventbrite. You can also purchase your tickets in person by just heading over to um, the church. And there you will be able to um, pick up tickets at Greater Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And you can also participate in the scavenger hunt. So we have six fabulous houses and one community space or church or public space that you all will get a chance to visit. So that's one of the events that's coming up. And so we welcome your attendance there. And then secondly, um, on Saturday, October 28th, there is going to be the Sherman Park Harvest Fest. Um, this is the second annual event. It was hosted last year. Um, by Milwaukee County Park System, as well as um, County Board Chairwoman uh, Marcelia Nicholson, the County Parks, SPCA, Boys and Girls Club, Friends of Sherman Park, and also the Parks Foundation. So last year we had a big turnout, probably a good 400 people showed up, kids in costume. It was fabulous and fun. So that event is going to be on Saturday, October 28th from 11 to 3. And there will be activities, fun booths, music, costumes, food, and much, much more. So we hope you'll join us. So with all that being said, I am going to introduce you all to our host for this evening, Mr. Steve O'Connell, um, along with his uh, sidekick here from Grassland Manor. Ms. Lauren Poppin, one of our board members as well. So with that being said, thank you all. Enjoy, and I hope you enjoy this webinar. Learn a lot. Great. Thank you, Mabel. So kind of you. Um, tonight, we want to look at two different aspects of the fall. Um, applesauce, being able to take some of the bounty of our produce and that type of thing, how to make an applesauce. Lauren's going to take care of that. And then in the middle of it, I'll take over and look at how to prep your yard and your garden for the winter. And then Lauren's going to come on at the tail end and show the finished product and possibly put it out for sharing. So Lauren, you want to take over from here? Sure. So we're going to skip around a little bit just so that apples can get cooking a little bit more. I have most of them in a pot on the stove back there. Um, I just wanted you to see before I um, finish. So this is the size of apples that I'm doing. I'm going to bring them up closer to the camera. When I make applesauce, I don't peel them. I don't core them. I cut them about this size, depending on the apples, either in quarters or sixths. And I throw them in a pot. I will be sharing the recipe that I am using. It is a USDA certified recipe, which I recommend for all canning recipes that you use, that you make sure that they are certified canning recipes. Um, but they get, for this recipe, all the apples get chopped and put in a pot with one to one and a half cups of water. So these are just gonna go in with the rest of them to wait. I'm sure many of you have cooked apples before. They turn bushy. I mean, that's all you're waiting for. You're just steaming and cooking apples, stir them occasionally. Um, but what I wanted to start with really is kind of some canning basics of what you need to do something like this. These apples I just bought at the grocery store because I don't have an apple tree right now and I didn't have time. 
to go to where I normally go to get apples. Normally, when I am planning to do applesauce, I actually try to do a couple of years worth of applesauce at once. So I'm probably going to go and get a bushel or two bushels of apples. And I have found, I haven't gone in a couple of years now, but I've found that the best place to get apples at an affordable price is Barkles. They do still allow people to pick windfalls, which are perfect for applesauce. Um, my only note is that because they are windfalls, you need to make applesauce the day you pick up the apples or the day after you pick up the apples. Because in one week, you'll be like, oh, there's all these bruises. And then you have to cut out those pieces and they aren't as good. So make sure you plan ahead if you're doing that. But if you're, um, if you want them for applesauce apples, not for storing apples, the last time I went there, it was $7 for a bushel of apples. That is $7 for 50 pounds of apples. And that's a lot cheaper than getting, unless you have an apple tree in your yard where they're free or your neighbor doesn't use their apples. That actually makes applesauce a lot more affordable than even if you bought a couple jars at the grocery store, you've just made 50 pounds worth of applesauce for less than that cost you. So it can be very cost effective. So on to the regular canning aspect. I most of my recipes come from does this show regular or backwards? You guys see it regular, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So this is the two or three years old ball blue book of preserving. In most stores, I bought this at Meyer. In most stores that sell canning jars or things, they will have these jars there. It has more like magazine pages. They're really thin. There's 500 recipes in it, and it talks about canning, pressure canning, fermenting too. So it's not all water bath canning, which is what we're doing tonight. But they're usually affordable. They're usually under $10. And then you know that they are certified recipes that you can follow and not have to worry about things like botulism, which is the main thing that scares people about canning. And it's not as scary as people think it is. So just first off in the, sh in the chat, I'm going to share, this is a link to a photo of the applesauce recipe that I am using. I'll go through the, the basics of it, but just in case anybody wants to save it, this is the ball applesauce recipe. It is supposed to yield six pint jars. I am not always impressed by balls quantities. Sometimes I use, I end up with half of what they say I will get. Sometimes I end up with double what they say I will get. And I haven't found a system yet. So my rest, my recommendation is always to just, once you've made a recipe, write down what you got from it and remember that for next time because sometimes balls right on, but sometimes they're not. Um, so it says, to, it recommends to start with seven and a half to 10 and a half pounds of apples. I went to the grocery store and got three, three pound bag of apples. So I have nine pounds in the pot on the stove right now. Um, most of the time for applesauce, people prefer if you mix a variety of apples, a couple of sweet apples and sour apples, just to kind of get a little bit richer of a flavor profile on it. I believe I have Cortland's and Gala's in this, something like that. Um, I would say that my favorite one type of apple applesauce is Cortland apples. I think it actually, without blending any other apples, those works really well. So if I am going to pick windfalls, I usually try to go when it is Cortland time, which again, when you call orchards, you can see what's picking. And if something is just passed, you can call them and they'll tell you what's windfall picking. Um, the other items in this recipe are they recommend ball fruit fresh produce protector. If you are concerned about the browning of apples that is happening right now as my apples are sitting in a pot slightly oxidizing and then they turn a little tan instead of whitish. If you want perfectly white yellow applesauce, then you will peel your apples and you will use this fruit color protector and you will have very light colored, beautiful applesauce. And I don't care what my applesauce looks like. So mine will be pink because I have red skins on it. Um, so that is an optional step where you would soak your apples in this, in water with this substance in it. The recipe goes through that process. I've never done it. It's not hard. Um, and also you need one to one and a half cups of water. So that is in the pot. That's mainly just to make sure that the apples don't burn to the bottom of the pot. Optionally, you can add sugar to your applesauce. I have never added sugar to applesauce 
So I will not be doing that, but they list that you can add one and three quarter to two and a half cups of sugar optionally. That is all that is needed for applesauce. It is literally apples mushed up in jars. So other canning implements that are needed, you will need jars to put the applesauce in. I ran mine through the dishwasher today. As long as you wash them in hot and soapy water, you will be fine. You will need rings to put on the jars and you will need lids to put on the jars. These obviously still need to be washed in soapy water. Um, one note, I know it used to be practice that they said to boil your lids with your rings for 10 minutes. That is no longer what the recommended practice is since 20, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, sometime in the last decade. They've changed that process. They just actually recommend that you wash them in hot soapy water. There is, I'm sure there's a lot of science behind it. I don't have the actual results from the studies they did, but I'm sure it has to do with being in boiling water for that long might break down something of this. And then when you also put it in the water bath canning, maybe it lowered the rate of seal and you get better seal rates if you just wash that. Either way, it used to be recommended practice and now best recommended practice is just wash them in hot soapy water. Um, other things that you need, I will not be lifting this, but on my stove, that big dark colored pot is what is called a water bath. Um, if you want to learn to get into canning, you don't need to purchase a water bath pot. You could just use a regular pot that you have. The requirement is that your pot is, I would say, at least two inches taller than the jars that you are filling because you will need water to be at least one inch over this. And I don't like my pots to be fully to the brim, so I would, for safety reasons, want another inch at least over that. But that is generally the requirement of pot size. Um, so Water baths, pots come with this, came out of steamy water. So this is just a tray that keeps your jars from sitting right on the burner. It just, I have this sitting in it. So it's a, it's kind of a, a dual purpose that's because sometimes I double stack jars but this is just something it's a thin metal rack that keeps your jars from the bottom and that's just because if you put a glass jar directly on a stove top you can break the glass we all know this rule unless it's brown glass you don't heat it directly on the stove if you don't have one of these racks or a little insert like this that fits in the bottom of your pot you can use a dish towel or a silicone mat or something. You just need something that is a light layer that you can put on the bottom of inside of your pot so that your jars are not directly touching the bottom of the pot. So I have a canning pot. But again, not necessary. But I, canning supplies I would say are necessary is one of these jar lifters. This makes grabbing a very hot jar much easier than trying to do it with, even if you have those hot pad gloves, these get slippery. So you want one of these. Any jar, any store that sells canning supplies usually sells things like this in the same store. Um, and then I would say one of the other things that you need for applesauce is I have a motorized food mill. I will not be using it tonight. Some people have the food mill attachment for their KitchenAid mixer. If you have one of those, I highly recommend using it because it makes it very easy. Tonight we'll be using a Foley food mill. I think most people have seen these before. It's just a little thing, a little pot, and you turn it, and it scrapes, and it pushes mushy applesauce through the bottom, and the skin stay in the top, and then you clean it out, and you repeat and you keep stirring for a really long time. So again, one of those, those are also not very expensive. So applesauce, your your cost to entry can be pretty low. Um, and let me think, I think that is mostly where we can kind of pause at this point. 
So again, I have nine pounds of apples and one and a quarter cups of water in a pot. And I am just waiting for the apples to turn mushy. And I'll let you know how long that takes when we come back. But for right now, we're going to switch over to Steve to teach us about gardening and closing up your yard for fall. Great. Thank you. Any questions before we go any further? We got questions of Lauren. Anybody? So, Lauren, the sugar is optional. Sugar is optional. Okay. Okay. So, I know a lot of people, sugar and a little bit of cinnamon or nutmeg. Um, so, yep. that seasoning is always optional for us then. Okay. Great, great, great. Okay. Uh, screen sharing. Uh, let's see. There we go. Um, what I wish to do tonight is just to take more of a practical approach to winterizing our yards and our gardens for next season. And what I want to do is to kind of look at some practical steps that we can take um, and how we get ready uh, for the next season in our garden as well as our yard. So as we start out, let's go and talk about our yards. And the first thing that we really need to think about is we really need to get the shaggy grass uh, cut back um, because if you leave all that grass out there and you have weed seeds and things of that nature blowing around and the grass is falling down over your uh, weeds, um, they're gonna come right back in the spring. Um, and so a lot of um, people that I talk to suggest about an inch and a half to two inches, cut your grass that short. Um, and so that is really, really important. One of the things I do always caution us about is weed killer. It's really not the time to throw a lot of weed killer on your yard at this time of the year. Um, all that runoff, uh, fertilizer, weed killers, all that ends up for us in Lake Michigan. And so try to avoid anything that's going to run off, especially into our sewer system, which ends up in our, our um, sewer system itself, um, the huge, the large tunnel. And then that water sometimes gets expulsed right into the lake. Um, so being very careful about fertilizers and weed killers at this time of the year. If you are going to fertilize, and the beauty of Mo Milwaukee is malorganite. That slow release fertilizer, that's one of the best things that you can use. Um, we're really trying to get that root system uh, strengthened um, through the winter. And malorganite, that slow release um, fertilizer is excellent. Um, and that's not generally going to run off um, if you put on just a, a, a light layer of malorganite. And then the other thing you can do, and I actually had it done today, is aerate your lawn. Um, that, that whole plug system so that your lawn is beginning to be uh, opened up and then sowing grass seed um, at this time of the year. But make sure it's early. Um, we're getting now to the period where we're getting that real light frost in the morning. Grass seed is not going to grow when it gets hit by that light, that real light frost. And then obviously in a week or two, we're going to get a heavy frost. Um, so uh, throwing down your grass seed at this time of the year is really not not the, not, not the best thing to do. The sun, the warm temperatures, rainwater, perfect mix for just basic lawn care. Um, you do not have to do a lot of work uh, for a lawn that's really got long root systems and that's a firm um, uh, growing, growing system, as it were. Now, malorganite, and I've noticed that um, when I'm out walking some of the golf courses in the winter, the county's out there spreading it during the winter on top of the snow. Um, and evidently that works. Um, so just something to think about. I've never done it, um, but looking at what they do, it seems to work pretty good. Um, and then, and I'm not sure how you feel about it, but malorganite, I never put it in the veggie garden. Um, it's fine for um, our gardens with flowers and annuals and things of that nature, but 
I shy away from um, malorganite and the veggies. Um, and do you ever do that? You use malorganite? No, I haven't used malorganite in a long time. Yeah. And um, I'm kind of a lazy, fair gardener the way it is. <laughs> I just, I plant stuff. I hope for the best. I do yeah. my best with it. <laughs> well, and Mary, I check. Have, did you ever use malorganite in your backyard? Not on vegetables. No, yeah, same um, as me then. I have I have some areas that are low line uh, yeah. that tend to freeze out. And so I... I encourage them with a little bit of fertilizer. Yeah. The grass stuff, but no, not on vegetables. Yeah. Do you think malorganite would affect uh, pollinators adversely? No. Um, when I've talked to the MMSD folks, they it does not affect pollinators at all. Um, it's just, it, I, I'm never sure about the heavy metals. Do they really get the heavy metals out of that stuff? Um, and I'm, I'm not sure. And Dennis, at um, at the gardens out at the county grounds and and up there, um, he was always real reticent about malorganite, um, just to steer clear of it and not to use it. So that's very important. And then a couple other things, really, when you're raking your leaves, it's very important not to leave them in little piles in the yard. Um, a lot of mold. And a lot of weed seeds just lay underneath those leaves. Um, and so it's very important to get those leaves off your yard. Um, and the other thing is rodents. Um, you'll find out, and I've, I've noticed it a couple of times where I didn't clean up the leaves. There are mice under there all winter. And they're in and out running over to where we have um, our bird seed and bird feeders and things of that nature. And they go right back into the leaf piles. Um, so it's best to do is to remove those leaf piles, as it were, and the two and a half inches of cutting your grass. And then the important thing is to stop watering. Let just the rains and the cooler temps just keep your lawn moist. Um, there's no reason to be pouring a bunch of water on, on your yard, as it were. And then the same with your rain barrels and your gutter runoff that comes from uh, your hoses going out into the yard. Make sure you dump those rain barrels. Flip them over or empty them out and put them in the garage or something of that nature. Do not let those rain barrels freeze. They'll split at the bottom and you'll have a ruined rain barrel. So it's very important that those of us who have rain barrels, always to make sure you're taking care of those. And then finally, one of the things that kills grass is rock salt. And you know how much rock salt we throw around in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin. Um, I really encourage people to steer clear of throwing rock salt on your grass. Um, and even some of the chemicals, um, not the best thing for our grass. Um, so I would just keep in the back of your mind, kind of know where that grass line is along your sidewalk, and then be sure to avoid throwing too much um, rock salt and things of that nature. So any comments about yard care, lawn care? Yes, Steve. Yeah. Steve, don't didn't you mention a while back that um, when you drain your um, rain barrels, you'll fill as many gallons jugs of water as you can, keep them in the house to water your plants. Yes, and and Lawrence, Lawrence, a huge proponent of that. Also, yes, keep that keep that water. Um, that's rainwater, natural rainwater, rainwater, and it's beautiful for your in in house plants. Maybe um, it was Lauren that said that. <laughs> yeah, well, both of us. <laughs> yeah, Lauren's a huge proponent of it. And Lauren, what is your thing about the water, letting it sit in gallon jugs for a day or two to get that chlorine out? If you're using tap water, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But rainwater, you don't have to worry about it. No, you don't have to worry about it. So good call, Ann. It's very important to kind of save that water, especially for the winter. Um, so just regular milk jugs. Um, cleaned out and that type of thing. So that that's really important. Okay, now let's look at our veggie gardens. Um, and I'm going to do this kind of as a show and tell, a lot of pictures of things that I've been doing and that type of thing. Right now, fall crops. They're crops that love the cooler temps. Lettuces, I've got some green beans going right along the side of the house that, that really loves the heat of the house. Um, radishes, um, all those greens. They love cooler weather. 
Um, and you'll see some pictures I'll show you. Um, and for the um, collards and the mustards, they love a bit of frost. The flavor in your collards will dramatically change um, because of frost. Um, so leave those crops out there. Um, but the other ones, especially the radishes and uh, the lettuces, try to cover them when we get a heavier frost. Um, that will kill those really sensitive, but they love cool weather, but they don't like um, frost. And the big thing now that I'm really pushing for a lot of folks is it's time to put in cover crops. These cover crops, especially when you have just open, um, after you've cleaned up your garden and you have just dirt, open dirt, the cover crop adds nitrogen. It's a natural compost when we get to the spring. And remember, we're always thinking in the back of our mind to avoid tilling. That rototiller is not good for us. Um, even though people talk about rototilling your garden, you just want to do the no-till. The cover crop, you're just turning that material into your soil. It's a natural compost. And the beautiful thing is, if it's a dry winter, what happens in a dry winter? we lose a lot of that beautiful topsoil we have blown off. The cover crop keeps it from blowing away. And erosion of your organic topsoil, that's a garden killer. Remember, we've worked how many years to get that topsoil perfect for growing? And if you have a dry winter and you don't have a cover crop, you're gonna have a lot of that blow away. Um, we used to call it snurt out in North Dakota. Snow and dirt, snurt. And they would always laugh about it. You can see it across the fields, the snurt. Like, they got a point. Uh, you don't want to lose that um, topsoil. Um, I've got a hairy vetch type of, um, of growth, uh, some rye grain, um, a winter pea, um, and then some rye grass, a little clover mix. Um, and that seems to be perfect. Um, and if anyone needs any, just let me know. Um, I've got a bunch of it um, to pass out to folks and I'll just put it in a bag and get it to you. Um, but you gotta get it in soon. Um, I put mine in, I'll show you some pictures in a sec. I put mine in about a week, a week and a half ago and it's already up about like this already. Um, and so it's growing perfectly. Um, now, a word about leftover produce. Make sure you rake it all up. Um, pick it up and get it off of the garden. Um, what's going to happen is in the spring, you're going to have all kinds of seeds from that stuff, and you're going to have errant plants that you didn't plant. Um, and those, especially tomatoes, those seeds stay in the soil. And a lot of times we talk about in Wisconsin that's going to kill the uh, tomato plant, tomato seeds. I'm here to tell you it doesn't. And I got tomatoes sometimes. Anne's like, how those tomatoes get in my garden in the flowers. But again, that stuff's in my compost pile and we throw it in, even it's been there for two years, those seeds will still grow. It's pretty amazing. Um, so you always got to kind of avoid that. Um, they'll come back to get you in the, uh, in the spring. Now some pictures. Um, there's the, that's my bountiful sweet potatoes from this year. Um, all of you who remember my mound garden, I put sweet potatoes in this year and that's how many sweet potatoes I got um, out of that small mounded garden. Um, there's the tomatoes. The tomato plants are still going. Um, the ones in the straw bales, um, that's how big they are. There's all kinds of tomatoes in there. And then my greens, the greens are right along the side of the house um, over with the raspberries. Um, and you see how many greens I have. That's two, four, six. That's seven plants, all those greens over there. Um, that's pretty amazing for just seven plants. Um, and I'm just waiting for a little bit of frost before I pick some more of those. I've been picking them and sharing them with the neighbors. Um, they're really excellent greens. Those are collards. Now, Swiss chard <coughs> is a perfect time of the year for Swiss chard. <coughs> it grows like, like you can't believe. 
Um, and as you can see, that's just a small por portion of my Swiss chard. It's growing like weeds, as it were. Here is my cover um, for the lettuces. Um, lettuces and, the, and you can see the radishes on the edge. Um, so I'm always very aware of frost at this time of the year. So I have a covers. Um, and these basically are the covers for in the spring when you're starting crops. Um, and those are perfect. Uh, here in the picture, as I see in the picture, it's open the whole way. If I bring it down, it's about that much in the spring. It just gets enough cool air and warm air in there. Um, and so that's my cover uh, for my lettuces and things of that nature. And then the green beans. This is the second crop of green beans that I've had for this year. Um, going up my, my uh, trellis there um, works out perfect for us. The uh, lettuce, this is my third crop of lettuce this year. I've done extremely well with the lettuce. And the Swiss chard, this is the second crop of the Swiss chard. Um, so I've actually had a very, very good year. Um, so um, that kind of just a quick overview, show and tell of some of the stuff that we produce produce that we've grown. Now, cover crop. <clears throat> the one little square, um, this is a raised garden that I use for potatoes and things of that nature. And you can see how I sowed the cover crop right on top. The other is the mound garden. Um, and you can see how I sowed that. Um, and I moved that rhubarb plant. It's a good time of the year to remove and to transplant perennial plants. And I'm changing the rhubarb into my mound garden um, so I can get a little bit bigger than it's been. And then the other, the third picture, you can see right in the middle there, that's where you can see the uh, cover crop growing already. Um, and that's about a week old. I took that picture um, about a, a week or so ago. Um, and the cover crop came up right away with that one rain that we had. Um, and it just starts to grow. And now if you went out there, you'll see how it's covered already. The mound is completely, the mound garden is covered um, by all of that, which is working out perfect. So that's a word about cover crops. Anybody tried those, the cover crops? And have you tried cover crops? No, I never had. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's a good way to protect your soil. Um, it's a good way to add nutrients to your soil. Mm -hmm. um, so Carl, have you been doing anything of this nature? No? So you're just here to learn? Do you just toss the cover crop seeds on top? and Right on top. You don't yeah. need to. Yeah, yeah. Or the problem has been the squirrels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the birds. All of a sudden, I mean, they descend on this like like Donkey Kong. Um, so I've been <laughs> trying to avoid that. Um, and so, so you'd have to almost overseed to make up yeah, to. Yeah. Okay. And you see how much seed I put on there, on the little square. Um, the mound garden, I covered that. And then sowed some more seed on top of it. So uh, kind of a two base type of seeding. The other one, I just seeded it real thick on top. Um, that came up right away, but the squirrels, I've got a, um, a, well, actually my trellis for my peas, I put that on top and now some chicken wire. And the squirrels are just, they're digging and rooting around and eating the stuff as fast as it comes up. Um, so that so, list uh, of cover crops, um, yeah, is that some, are those, <clears throat> did you buy those separately and then put them into a mix or is that something you can buy that's all together? It, good question. And it does come together. Mm -hmm. um, so you can buy all different kinds of mixes. The hairy vetch is one of those that tries to, that grows the roots down and keeps your erosion down. The rye grain and the winter peas, that comes up right away. Um, and that's a really good um, nitrogen, um, puts all kinds of nitrogen in the soil. The rye grass and the clover mix, that's for just the, the look of the whole thing. Um, it really makes it look nice. Then in the spring, you just shovel it all. Just under. turn it under. Yeah, just um, I just take a hand trowel or whatever, just roll through it. Yeah. And it's just perfect. Uh, compost right in your in your soil as it were oh, um, let's so, try that next year yeah yeah you can 
You can still try it this year, I think. And if you want some seeds, I'll, I'll get them over to you. <coughs> You're interested. So just let me know. Okay. This is your compost time. Um, all of that stuff, leaves, grass, um, any of your stuff that's left over from the garden, it's time to compost. Um, compost is your natural, as I say, you're growing dirt. You're literally, in two years, you'll have some perfectly, unbelievably good dirt um, soil for your garden. Um, but one of the things to avoid Anything that has a blight or a disease, you do not want that in your compost pile. Um, and I avoid um, leaves with black spots or anything that's got a mold or any odd colors to the leaves. Um, I avoid putting those in the uh, compost pile. You're just looking for trouble down the road. If you can't get that compost pile up to about 160, 180, <laughs> you're not going to kill off the diseases. Um, and so it's very important Just avoid anything that's got a blight or mold or odd colors, things of that nature. Um, so it's very important to avoid that. Now, water. Water is vitally important to a compost pile. Once you get all your material in there, and remember, green, brown layers, green, brown, green, brown, stirring, constantly stirring your compost pile. That water is very, very important that it begins to get the heat up in your compost pile. One of the things you want to avoid is too much water. And your compost pile literally will freeze solid. Um, and your red wigglers, your worms, your hardworking worms, they're going to go so deep down into your pile that it's going to take a while in the spring for them to get back up into your pile. Um, and so you kind of want to avoid getting that uh, compost pile too frozen. Um, so avoid putting too much water. Um, like today, I took the lid off. I let it rain a little bit, went back out about uh, two hours later, back on. I'm um, just enough to get some water in there. Um, and so it's very important to kind of think about how much water you're pouring in on there. And of course, as I say, green, brown layers. One of the things I really caution you against don't take leaves and clutter off of the street. Make sure your leaves and all that, it comes from your yard or a neighbor's yard, but make sure the neighbor is not treating their yard um, with weed killers. Weed killers are the death of your compost pile. Uh, never put grass treated with weed killers in uh, the residue into your compost pile. So be very careful. If you're going to go and ask a neighbor, can I take some of your leaves? Ask right away if you had your yard treated. Um, you don't want any of that stuff in your compost pile. And the stuff in the street, you've got oil, you've got antifreeze, you got all kinds of stuff that you don't want in your, in your compost pile. Um, and those of us who do adopt a drain, all that stuff I take out of those drains goes in my garbage bin. I do not put that stuff in my compost pile. Um, I had a little bit of a run-in. You'll love this story. A little bit of run-in with the guy street sweeping. <laughs> and when they put out the uh, bin for the street sweeping, and I had three, three five-gallon buckets of junk that I got off the street. So I went over there, and I was going to pour it in. Of course, he started yelling at me. I said, no, come on, man. This is your stuff. I do adopt a drain. Oh, then you're fine. Dump it in. <laughs> So he knew right away um, that you can't have that stuff in your in your uh, uh, compost pile. So, okay. So Steve, if if you're if um, yeah, yeah. If your grass has been treated with weed killer, that will affect the leaves on the trees also. Yeah, well, it 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 affects your compost pile itself. But I mean, um, you shouldn't even get the leaves from the trees. Well, yeah, that's the thing. You're down in that grass. You know, and when you cut, you mix it, you mulch it all together. So when we, at that time of the year, we just leave the mulch on the ground. We don't collect it up and put it in the compost pile. Um, so Steve, that, what do you, okay. what do you use as your browns? My browns are basically leaves and cocoa shells. Oh, okay. Yeah, cocoa shells. Um, phenomenal for compost. Um, 
and and they right away they heat up. Compost uh, grows with that. The the uh, cocoa shells, um, steins, any of those places about five dollars. About maybe twenty pound bag. It's a big bag. They're not. It doesn't weigh much. Um, mm -hmm. And those things. That's perfect. That brown year round. I use the the con the, the cocoa shells. Anything of that nature. Um, so. Good question, Lauren, because you get into the summer, you don't have brown like that. Uh, right. So we that's... we started all of the yard weeds that we pull out of the yard. Um, we let it dry in the sun. So instead of adding it as a green, we let it bake. And then we actually have a shredder so that it is a, a nice little powder that we can mix in well. Very good. That's excellent. I have the shredder also. And I like all the raspberry canes and all that yeah i shred all that kind of stuff that becomes my brown too that's that's a good point lauren that's excellent actually shredding is the best thing for it um you create your brown so okay here's the compost bins the first two the round one and the square one those are this year's compost um and so that's the green stuff that i started this year the third one that will be next year's dirt um soil I mean, it has to go through another winter and another year um, out in the sun. And the big round one, that's this year's dirt. So I'm going to use that for next year's gardening. Um, the best thing, Lauren, is this true for you also? The best thing to do with your compost, as soon as there's no worms in there, you know you have soil. The worms are done doing what they're doing, and they go over to the other piles. They just migrate. Um, and so as soon as I don't see any worms, I know I've got good soil. I actually haven't paid attention to the worm content of my compost. Maybe I should more. But uh, <laughs> when it looks like dirt after about two years is when it's, I say it's done. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, you, you, will, you will see there's no more worms in there. They're now I'm going to watch. Yeah, they're done work and they're going over these other piles. They literally migrate on you. Okay, the pile in the middle, um, those are the sweet potato, um, as Lauren said, the sweet potato rinds and vines and everything just laying there in the sun, starting to dry out for me. Um, and so I just leave them there. Um, as soon as I empty out the big, the, uh, the end uh, compost bin with the fresh dirt, that stuff goes in there. And this is the green one, the round one right in the middle, the middle one. That's what it looks like with the stuff from the garden. You'll see some tomatoes and things of that nature. Um, so I pack all that into that one. Um, those two, the first and the second one, that's what it looks like, um, the green. And now the this one, the, the one with the uh, cocoa shells on top, there's a, a perfect example of the brown layer. Um, this one, it's, this is two years yet to go before you have compost. The one in the middle, you can't quite see the worms, but that one, as I flipped it over, you would see worms, red wigglers running in all directions. Um, and that's what it looks like. Um, that would be next year's, it'll go through the next year before it becomes uh, soil. And the Rauman, there's what the soil looks like um, at the end. Um, and that, that, that soil is ready to go. Um, and it's perfectly, it's amazing soil. Um, so I'm taking out one of my um, trugs. I'm switching out that dirt because um, it's been in there for four years. This is going to go in that truck. This is the dirt for next year's garden, literally. Um, and I'll switch out that dirt into the mound garden and mix it up with, with that really good dirt that I have in the mound garden. That dirt will become part of that. It'll be revitalized by that that other dirt that's in the mound. That's that's kind of how I I keep keep it all moving as we go along. So, any questions on composting? Uh yeah. So now I'm really concerned because the last few years I would rake up leaves in the front of my yard and throw them in my compost bin. Yeah. So. Have I been screwing up? <laughs> well, it isn't screwing up. It's just, you're never quite sure about disease with those things. Mm. Um, and Lauren's right. 
I'll sometimes dry them out for a week or two or three and then run them through my chopper. And then I'll throw them in there. It's not bad then. You chop all that up. I think that kind of gets rid of some of that dust and that mold that's on those leaves. Um, and then throwing them in the compost pile. Um, I do that. That's a good way to recycle that. Um, but Ann, you're okay. It's just, I'm always kind of leery of it and being real careful about disease. Um, and a compost pile, if it gets up to 160, 180, it's going to kill off the disease. But you got to work <laughs> to get it that hot. Um, Ann's always con concerned because I'm taking the meat thermometer out there and <laughs> sticking it to what my disease looks, what my temperature looks like. Uh, but that's all part of it. keeping an eye on your compost pile. Any other questions about compost piles? Okay, let's move on to. Excuse me, I do have a question. This is yeah. Betty Haas. Betty, Jeff, do you do you welcome. ever? Thank you. Um, do you ever use a compost accelerator? Yes. Um, and all you want is, oh, mercy. Talk about compost accelerator. If you walked over, um, I walk on Underwood Parkway. And on uh -huh. the other side of the expressway is where the city of Wauwatosa composts their leaves. Oh. And they use an accelerator all winter. And by April, it's so sweet smelling. You would be amazed at the oh odor. And okay. Betty, they're, they, I know they use a nitrogen accelerator. Um, okay. And it, it's amazing. And they have dirt within within a year with the accelerator. Well, yeah, um, I always was of the impression that uh, we could would could create compost within a year. And of course, yeah. that hasn't happened much. <laughs> well, but, um, if the accelerator, if it's high in nitrogen, uh -huh. it'll happen. Yeah. Okay. I'll check. Yeah. I'll I'll check. Yeah. I did buy some and I will uh double check on it. Thank you. I find all this information very, very, very helpful. Thank and you. Betty, I I today or yesterday, no, today, I threw in some blood meal into mine. That's an accelerator. Oh. Um, I had it left over from when I was treating my uh straw bales for the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, I'm going to throw it in and fire up the um, the compost. Um, so anything that's organic and natural like that, that that just speeds things up for you, Betty. But I have not seen it. It still takes, Laura, and you're right, it still takes us two years to create good. good well, <laughs> so I, that's I don't good know to know. admit this. I practice a little bit of controversial composting, uh -oh. um, which is more acceptable for me because I do not plant food crops in my yard. I am oh, generally yes. composting on plants, but also I have a friend who works in organic certification and she approves of my compost practices as well, but I purposefully buy corn and wheat based cat litter to add to my compost because I do not like the idea of throwing away pet waste, especially a whole bunch of cat urine. So I kind of do add a nitrogen accelerator because there's a lot of wheat with cat pee that goes into my compost. And I actually do have mostly dirt within about a year, but I let it sit for two years to get hot and be stirred in that because of my slightly controversial composting practices. I will note here that you cannot compost clay cat litter because clay is dirt and it will yeah. not, it will stay cat litter. If you ever think of doing this, you have to buy a specific more expensive cat litter. That's a good point. Cause I, I, I just completely shy away from any animal waste in, in our compost pile. So good point though. And, and, if you're not, and Lauren, you're probably right. You're not using it for veggies. You're using it for nope. your yard and your plants. It's, it's going on flowers. Yeah, so flowers. I don't so eat them. <laughs> you might be safer, but I would never advise it for uh, for for veggies. Um, Unless you know that it's getting, if you're 
if you're no. temperature testing it to make sure that it's hot enough, but you got to be really on top of it. it is, this is not for like a no. occasional don't really care about composting, still going to put it on food. It's it's not worth messing with it. No, it's not for a rookie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good point. I, I didn't think you're going to bring that up, Lauren. Mercy. <laughs> you were talking about nitrogen additives. It's a perfect I one. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, let's look at next year's crops. And uh, the one I want to talk about is garlic. Um, if you're planting bulbs of any kind, and you're, you, you're, you're usually on top of this, uh, it's very important to get your bulbs in at this time of the year. Um, make sure it's sunny, midday. Um, so the temperature of the dirt, the ground is is up a little higher um, when you put your bulbs in. Um, and then the other thing is be very careful, especially at this time of the year when we get excessive moisture in the morning and frost, stay out of your garden. Um, and it kind of applies all year round. Um, if you're rubbing up against your plants, you get any disease or um, anything on your pants and that type of thing. And then that gets into your plants. Um, just stay out of the garden in the morning um, when you have a lot of moisture. This time of the year, as you notice, we get a lot of the moisture. Um, and so it's really it's not safe to be in the garden. And there's the rhubarb plant that I mentioned. Um, it's in picture with the mound garden. Just best time is to move your perennials at this time of the year. You're going to transplant them, pick them up and move them, um, pack them in with dirt and compost. Uh, real important. Um, now, gar garlic. Garlic is a good plant, especially for rookies and novices. Um, it, get a head start on the season for next year. Um, best to plant it at this time of the year. Um, your harvest will be early fall next year. You'll have beautiful garlic if you get it started in the fall of the year before. Um, and I'll show you a picture in a second. I'm putting it in my trug this year. I'm going to try it in the trug rather than in the ground um, to see how, how it works. And I'll show you how I'm going to monitor the moisture. Um, and I've got it in with my leeks um, so that one shrug is just going to be those types of plants, leeks. And I'm going to probably throw some onion sets in there with the garlic. So any of those uh, basic plants of that nature. Um, and then, of course, finally, make sure you get all the leaves and other plant debris out of your garden. Um, try to have your garden as clean as possible. Otherwise, you're just bringing back all kinds of weeds. Um, and again, cover crop is the way to go. Okay. Now, garlic planting. Um, on the left side, you'll see how I, this is a, uh, this is a truck, uh, the raised garden. Get that soil all ready. Uh, you'll see how the rosemary sitting on the edge there. Um, so I just turned it all under. Um, that's really a good example and this is a good example of no-till, just roughing the ground, um, as it were. And then, if you know how to plant uh, garlic, take the bulb and each one of the little uh, pieces of the bulb itself, you plant down into the ground uh, with a root base in the dirt and the, the top of it just barely below the soil. And you just a little hole, basically you stick your thumb in and then stick in your garlic and then just cover it over real lightly uh, covered over. Um, this year, the pestilence has been a squirrel. I don't know why the squirrel likes garlic. Um, he's been digging it up constantly and chewing on it. And then I come back out there, I got to put it back in the ground. Um, so I don't know why I've got a squirrel that loves garlic. Um, so that's basically what it looks like. Um, so that's prep soil. And then the garlics themselves actually planted. So questions on that? When I would plant garlic, um, yeah. I would go to the yeah. West Dallas Farmer's Market yeah. and buy a really nice couple of uh, organic bulb, uh, heads yeah. and then just break those, get the bulbs from there. Isn't that great? Yeah. And and you know exactly what kind of garlic you're going to get. Uh, yeah. And then there's hard neck and then there's soft, soft neck. neck. Yeah. yeah. I think the hard, is the hard neck, is the hard neck easy? It preserves longer, is that? It does. Yeah, it and then does. you get those scapes that you can cook. <laughs> That's Lauren's <laughs> favorite thing. <laughs> How many did you have this year, Lauren? You had a mitt full of those. 
<laughs> I think I had over 20 pounds of scapes to process this year. It's many gallons. I made uh, seven, seven gallons of garlic scape relish. That's amazing. <laughs> and all that was out at your, at your, uh, uh, my farm. Yeah. Yeah. The farm. Wow. That's amazing. How much garlic did you guys have then? Uh, I mean, it's, I don't know. I should know what size our fields are, but it was just a wow. field of garlic. It we only be. plant two to three acres in vegetables and garlic is just a small part of it. Yeah. So, but it seeded itself, didn't it? Isn't that amazing? No, it's planted. It's planted every year. No, but your your uh, your scapes are all from seeds. Oh yeah, they're all they're all from there. There's a scape yeah. harvest day in springtime. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you guys are unbelievable. Okay, now almost forgot about our raspberries. As you all know, I got a huge thing of raspberries. Uh, the first thing I do is cut away those old canes. Anything that's dead, drying up, um, kind of just withering, get those canes out of there. Um, those you do not want um, left over through the winter. The green and producing plants, uh, how did I say waste cans? Uh, it's waist high uh, when you cut the stalks off. Um, it's really helpful to keep those tips from freezing. Um, and so to cut off uh, waist high, I don't know why the spelling came out the way it did. Um, but um, keep away, just keep down the freezing of the tips of your plants. The very important thing is mulch and clean out the old mulch. So you're going to mulch these plants, but get rid of that old stuff that's underneath there, leaves and things of that nature. That can be very detrimental to your plants. You can get a mold in there and that will make a mess of your uh, raspberry plants. Um, and then that also covers over the little plants that are coming up in the spring, that real wet, soggy stuff, it's going to basically keep down your plants from growing your new plants in the spring. So it's very important to do that. All your weeds, other plants, trees, anything that's rooted in the patch, get it all out of there. Um, all that stuff's got to go. Uh, there's no, actually no help uh, for your plants themselves. And finally, and here's what Lauren's talking about. A light cover of leaves and grass, that helps with, the, with just the mulching of the growing canes. So very, very light. And that's the stuff I chop up um, through the chopper. And then I throw that in there because um, that stuff doesn't clump up and it breaks down very quickly. And then, as I said, try to avoid the leaves from the gutter uh, on the street and that type of thing. So know your, as I say, know your leaves. Um, that type of thing. And let's see, here's where's the picture of the raspberries. Okay, here's here's what the raspberry plants look like. Um, and you see how big that, how big my raspberry patch is. Um, and as you can see, you can see through the, the, the stalks themselves, um, the canes and everything. You got to get it as, as clean as you can get it and then waist high. Um, that's usually kind of the direction I go in and just cut it off all the way across. Um, and I'll bet you, I think Ann made at least 16 little things of freezer jam. And I don't know how many pies we had. Uh, Lauren, people in the neighborhood come over and pick raspberries. Um, and, and they're just, they're plentiful. Um, and they grow like weeds, literally. Um, and they're beautiful plants. Um, and these plants, I dare say they are as old as, as we've been here. Um, 20, 30, um, 30 some years. Those plants are that old. Um, that, that patch has been there all this time between the houses. Um, and if you keep nurturing it, it's amazing. So uh, Mary, did you do raspberries or just your grapes? I, I have raspberries also. Yeah, that's what I, I thought. Have double, I have a double crop raspberry. Oh, do you do all oh, the the um, uh, spring fall ones? Right. Yeah, everberries. Yeah. 
Yeah, ours somehow or other, our ever bearings used to be along the wall by the garage. Mm -hmm. We took out the wall uh, to build a new wall. And somehow or other, those things are in this patch now. They seated <laughs> themselves. And so we have ever bearings in there with just the spring bearing. Yeah. Um, so now right. it's amazing. And we're, we're and transplanting some too. Um, They're right by my kitchen door. So that's a snack on my way to. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know where I sit in, on Monday morning out there on the yeah. patio. I can just reach right over. They're, they're literally <laughs> right, right here is the patio. You see the corner of the patio. I just reach over and pick raspberries as you guys are talking mm -hmm. on Monday morning. They're that close. Um, so it's a way to suffer, as I say. Yeah. Okay, let's let's finish up here. Uh, finally, tools. Um, checking on your tools and your storage. Um, make sure that you clean all your tools before you put them in the garage, um, your shed, wherever you keep them. Um, it's very important to get any residue, any possible... Um, blight or a mold or anything that might be in that dirt clumped on your uh, shovel, your hoe, whatever it might be. It's very important to get it clean. Rust. Rust on your tools is, is really no good for you. Scrape that dirt off, get all that stuff off, and then a quick clean with a wire brush. Sometimes I use the grill cleaner. Um, and then just oil it with a light oil. Um, cut down on that rust. You do not want the rust. Rust is, again, another disease as we're and you don't want it in your garden. Um, and it's very important. Don't store your tools in a moist moist area. Avoid standing water. Don't let them sit in the water and that type of thing in the winter. I flip them all upside down so the handle would be the only thing close to the ground, um, not, not the, uh, the metal part. Um, any tools that you know that have come into any contact with diseased plants, a quick bleach bath. Just run them through bleach water. Um, that way the fungus, um, and if you leave it in there in the winter, as I say, the fungus among us, that's in your tool bin. You do not need that in your tool bin, especially if you have a damp winter and your tools are in the, in the garage. And so you get frost and dampness, and then you've got a disease that's growing on your tools it's going to affect all the other tools that are in there with you. So it's very, very important to, to avoid that. And then you can use the same bleach bath um, for your containers. Um, my suggestion, growing pots, containers, anything that you use to grow plants in, just a quick bleach bath in the fall. Um, get all that stuff off, residue off those uh, containers. Same goes for your stakes. Anything that you use to support the plants. Especially like, for instance, if you had a tomato blight, blight and your cages were all against those leaves, it's important to, to bleach out uh, those, those, those cages or whatever you use to stake them up. Um, I literally, I hang all those on the wall in the garage away from moisture. Um, I get them up um, on nails um, so they're not in any way close to anything that might be moist and that type of thing. So... As I always say, you want to start the next growing season with a clean bill of health. Um, and so making sure your tools, um, any containers, any structures do not have any bacteria or any anything that's growing that you don't want back in your garden next year. So if you're going to have a, a um, organic garden, you don't need any disease as, as it were. So. Okay, any questions? I'm humming through it, so I give Lauren enough time at the end here. Everybody pretty good on kind of understanding the composting and things of that nature? Tyler, you've been pretty quiet. Anything you need to add to this? Uh, I do have a question, but I don't want to take up too much time. It's just about... Uh, yeah. If you have any advice about the proper use of malorganite. Very light in the uh, fall. And then in the spring, you can put on a good coat, a good coating of it. Okay. And like I say, I've just noticed, and I don't know, maybe the county knows something. We don't know. But they seem to be spreading it on top of the snow on the golf courses. 
I suspect that's their start to the spring as the spring, as the uh, snow melts, that malorganite goes right mm. down into the ground. Um, so I've noticed that. Okay. So they put a coating on there. Um, so that's a good question though, Tyler, just how much to put on, how much to avoid. That's important. It's all about the roots of your grass. Um, making sure you have a firm root system in your grasses, your grass. You know, I noticed that when we had that drought this summer, yeah. the grass was just, didn't look like it was ever going to recover. And now I look out in the yard and I can't believe it's as green and beautiful as it is. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> hey, you, I've, you always, the... I've always heard that if you're going to commit to watering during a drought, you have to keep it up. Yeah, it's worse for the grass if you start and then stop yeah. or else just let it go. And then yeah. when we do yeah. start getting rain, it will just recover. Yeah, you're spot on. You know, and Anne, it's very important that root system, you know, and I and I think there's a lot to be said for the, and Lauren, you're the proponent of it, the natural grasses, that root system goes down so deep. And Lauren, you had hardly any die off this year in your yard, did you? Didn't you? No, my yard stayed green pretty much the whole year. I didn't have any brown come in other than like when the daisies die, they turn brown, yeah. that yeah. sort of normal stuff. But yeah, drought, drought die off. I didn't have any. No, that's amazing. I watched your yard and you had no die off this year. It was pretty amazing. I had yeah. an explosion of coneflowers this year. <laughs> I did notice that. But you don't water though. No. No, you, you don't do anything. And I still amazing. look. When I, with the rain barrels, I do still, um, like during the drought, I was watering um, my shrubs and oh, yeah. a couple other things just because they're only on year three and I want to make sure that they stay healthy, but I don't water the coneflowers for sure. No, it's, it's amazing. Um, your yard never suffers. Um, and I can imagine, what do you think? Those roots are down, what, 12, 18 inches, 24 inches? At least, I mean, that's what they say yeah. is that they the roots are at least as deep as the plant, and the plants are often three feet tall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Um, so the, your your yard is a good example of how to go wild, uh, <laughs> literally, and no problems at all, no watering or anything. So good, good example. So Lauren, okay. you've got, Lauren, you you don't have you do have grass, but you also have. I have. A, in my lawn section, which is not most of my yard, um, I have a mixture of clover and a variety of grass that does not go to seed and generally does not grow more than six inches tall, so I never have to mow. Hmm. I have to weed, yeah. so there's not no yard work, <laughs> but I don't have a lawnmower anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Okay, any other questions before we turn it back to Lauren to look at the finished product? Applesauce. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Talk about your lawn and your garden for next year. Thanks, Steve. You Thank are you. welcome. Thank you. Lauren, it's all yours. Okay, well, yeah. while Steve has been talking, I have been standing here continuously using a Foley food mill. So I just finished pretty much. I'm doing my last runs through. I would say that to cook the nine pounds of apples, to get them mushy enough to run through, took 30, 45 minutes, something like that, of cooking over the stove. Um, so in batches, I'm going to scrape this off so I don't make a mess. You can see what's left in the Foley food mill is a lot of skins and mostly dried stuff. So all of this will go in my compost bin. Um, and what we have, I'm gonna grab a spoon. The applesauce itself looks like this. It is not very pink this time. And I end up with, so this is how big my pot is for scale. And the applesauce is to 
here. It's about halfway, about to there on the pot. So this, I can't remember what size pot this is. It's probably a no. two, two gallon. Something like that. Yeah. So this is how much applesauce we ended up with. After you have all of your applesauce run through the mill, again, if you want to do choppy, chunky applesauce, you would peel and core the apples, get all the seeds out of it, and cook them down and mush it up as much as you would want to, and you don't need to run it through a food mill because you just leave whatever chunks, chunks you want. But this has to go back to the stove and be brought to a boil. So Lauren, do you leave the skins on just for extra flavor? I leave the skins on for laziness. Oh. <laughs> Told, filling apples take a long use time. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever canned apple pie filling or something like that, but oh, peeling and coring and slicing apples for things like that is a much more time intensive process than applesauce. Um, you get more applesauce and so the next part of the process, so what we have to do now is wait for the applesauce to come to a boil. It was still pretty warm, so it shouldn't generally take that long. Um, also, while you're doing all of this prep work, it's generally recommended that your water bath is being brought up to a simmer. You don't want that to be boiling when you put jars in it. Even though they are hot jars, it's still better to start with a simmer because if your jar happens to be too much below boiling and you put it into a bath, a bath of water, boiling water, you can crack a jar. So just all things, it's easier to avoid those things and it takes a little bit longer than because then you have to bring the water bath to a boil. But it's worth it because if you've ever broken a jar, you know how absolutely terrible it is because then you have to clean out everything and start over because you have a busted jar and shards of glass in your pot. I've done it once and it will never happen again. Um. So again, I have this big pot on the stove. I did forget to tell you about one other absolutely required tour tool. That is this jar ladle, jar, fun jar funnel. That's what it's called. So this fits perfectly inside the narrow regular mouth jars so that you don't make a mess. Um, I'm really close to a boil, but Basically, the process that we will go through here is once I reach a boil, I will take that pot off the stove, grab my ladle, and ladle the applesauce into these jars. Your instructions should be telling you how much headspace to use in a jar. Um, yeah, so most of them, it is a half inch headspace. But always do what your recipe says. You can measure on a jar with a ruler if you would like to know specifically. But generally, if you're looking at jars, for the most part, you want to fill to this little rim area. And the space above that is about a half an inch. So that's usually your safety line is fill to this where it, the glass goes out on the threading a bit. You will fill to that and then... After that has applesauce in it, you will take a damp cloth and wipe around the edge because even though you're using a funnel, you can still somehow get splatter there and any little speck can prevent it from sealing. And then it's just a sad thing. So, applesauce is spitting at me, so that means it is boiling. Now, Laura, do you have to sanitize your funnel? I've heard that you should boil the funnel. The Right. So the funnel, I run it through the dishwasher with the jars. So again, okay. that's my sanitation process. For most implements, they do say as long as you're washing them in hot soapy water, you are fine. I know not everyone has a dishwasher. A dishwasher, maybe, like, it makes me feel better because then I know it's super hot water. I can't touch the hotness of that water. I'm going to see if I can get down enough camera angle just to see. So this is the basic process of filling a jar. I know this part seems self-explanatory, but there's a little 
Other trick that I want to show you once the jar is full. So once I start to get pretty close, then I generally grab a little spoon because I don't want things to be over full. So you're kind of eyeballing at the jar to make sure that your level of fullness is still leaving a half inch. So that's why this little, little spoon is helpful. And that's also how you can get messy things on the rim because not everything was done with the funnel. So I have this cloth and I wipe around here. And then what you'll do when you put your lids on is, um, I still have to wash these. So I'm gonna do a demonstration and then I'm gonna actually can these later after the webinar because there won't be time to do all of it. So you will take your lid and put it, just set it on the jar and you will take your rim. And they always say to do it finger tight. And what finger tight means is essentially I'm taking very lightly these two fingers and once it is tight enough that like the jar starts to spin itself, I'm not trying to tighten it more than that. That is what finger tight is. I can still crank down on this lid another, at least an inch, um, but I will not be doing that because I want a little bit of looseness there. And once you get to this point, then you would take it here and walk over and put it in the water bath. So the last step of the process then is the, the water in the water bath has to be at least an inch over the top of all your jars that are inside of it. And for pints of applesauce, they have to reach a rolling boil for 20 minutes. So after I put them in the water bath, that is not when the timer starts. That is when I put the lid on and then I wait for a lot of steam to be coming out from the side of the pot. And that means that it's a rolling boil. And then I set a timer for 20 minutes. And after that goes off, I turn off the stove and I take off the lid and I set a timer for five minutes and you want the jars to rest in the hot water for another 10 minutes or five minutes after their processing time because that helps in the eventual sealing process. If you take them out right away, they are at such a hot temperature that the temperature change and fluctuation is not good enough and you're, you're gonna have a lower seal rate. You'll probably still get most of them to seal but you will have a much higher seal rate if you wait that extra five minutes before you take them out. I understand that that means you have to process a little slower because then if you're doing multiple rounds, your water got that much cooler and you have to wait to put the next ones in. But believe me, it's worth it. Um, when I take mine out, I generally leave them in the oven overnight and don't look at them again until the morning to check for seals. Some people put them out on the counter. I don't always have a lot of counter space. And so, I mean, if I'm using my oven, I obviously don't put them in there, but I have two ovens in my oven. So there's usually one that's available for me to throw some jars in and wait overnight. And in the morning, you check to make sure that center button is pressed down. Um, if you can push it down, then you have to put that applesauce in the fridge and eat it. And that's the end. So I will have applesauce later tonight. Um, it is just about all ready to go. So if anyone who is on the webinar would like any of this applesauce, please feel free to leave your contact information in the chat or send it over to Mabel at the SPCA and we will get you a jar of applesauce. I know where and you live. Lauren, sorry. you don't, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Steve. That's fine. Uh, so Lauren, you don't tighten that the lid at all even after it comes out of even after it's sealed when you check oh it. sorry after i should mention that part after they are sealed in the morning um i take a wet cloth and i actually wipe down the entire i take off the the rim make sure that the lid is sealed i take a wet cloth and i wipe down around the entire outside of the jar around this part of the jar around the top of the lid Applesauce sometimes leaves things sticky. Like you just don't want anything on the outside of your jar because that can mold. It doesn't mean, if you do have a little bit of mold on the outside here, it does not mean what is inside is necessarily bad, but it's not nice. 
So it's best to just clean off your jars first thing in the morning. I also then write a label of what is in it and the date that I canned it on the lid. And then um, storage, actually, it is most recommended to store with this off. So when you take it off to clean, because and the main reason for that is because then you won't have a false seal. So in general, it is recommended that you store them with just the flat lid on. So they will be full and look like this in your basement. If you need to give them away to somebody, then obviously give them a, a rim with it so that it can be fridge stored. But while it is just, if it's just for your personal use basement storage, it is recommended to not store them with rims on. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I've never heard that before, Lauren. I always it's not a it's, again, it, it's not a requirement. Yeah. Anytime before you open a jar, you should always check for a seal. If you can, if when you're opening a jar, you can kind of just like fairly easily, like here, I have, I did not can this, but I can this one. <laughs> this is a jar of sauerkraut that someone can. If I could just take my fingers and fairly easily lift off, usually I, I don't have that strong of nails. I generally use this church key that I have hanging here to open up all of my jars. And I hear, you hear that really good suction noise. If you are able to just kind of lift it off and maybe it makes a little noise, then I would feel a little skeptical about eating what's in that jar. Um, but you can see this one here was stored on my counter with the rim still on it. So I don't always follow that practice, but sometimes I do. It kind of just depends on what state I'm in. A lot of my canning goes back to the farm. And because they are stayed there, I send them there with the rims on because they will need them to store after they open the jars. Um, but, and it's not, I mean, generally if you're eating them within the 12 to 18 months that is recommended, then you're fine. You can eat canned goods that are stored longer than that. I regularly do. Um, the nutritional content goes down more so. It's a textural thing that if you wait longer than the 18 months, your pickles might not be as crispy anymore, but for apple saucers, and that's the main thing that I eat that's a few years old. I, I got some applesauce given back to me that we had canned some years ago, and so I'm still working through it. Um, but I haven't noticed a flavor distance difference in the applesauce, but I have not tested it for nutritional content to see if it has less vitamins than one-year-old applesauce. <laughs> That's great. You know, I heard a story once. The reason I asked about the the rim part of it um, is that a woman canned a bunch of stuff and she left the rims just lightly. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and her husband came along unbeknownst to her and thought he was doing her a favor and tightened them all. And then on, she didn't realize it and she stored them all in the basement. And then in the winter, she went to get a can and they were all moldy. <laughs> And I break because the seal. You've done this thing. Yeah, yeah you break the seal. Cleaning, cleaning after canning is a very important step. Yeah. Well, that's great. Lauren, thank you. Good job. You did well with the camera <laughs> for all of our concerns. It yeah. worked well. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Any other questions, everybody? Betty, how about you? Any questions for us? No, but I thought the information you all provided was wonderful Thank and you. very informative on all levels. We this is Betty, be and yes, I don't have any more. Well, my only question, I guess, would be, yeah. uh, is this recorded and somewhere where we could watch it again? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes. It, it is recorded. Um, once um, It takes about a week um, that we share it on our website and then we also have a youtube channel channel betty that we share it on as well i didn't realize that thank mm -hmm. you we're trying to get into the 21st century aren't we mabel we're trying <laughs> we're trying to bring everybody with us come on <laughs> it's a job okay mabel you got the last the last word tonight all right well thank you all for joining us um, I hope you learned a lot because I did and I learned a lot about um, composting. Steve, you got a lot of compost bins. I've got to get one of those going. 
And um, Lauren, thank you for the applesauce uh, presentation. I need a jar of applesauce. <laughs> so I'll be looking forward to that as well. But I'll bring them to the housing tour on Sunday. Yeah. Oh, hey, there you go. That's you go. right. Let me reannounce that. We do have the Sherman Park. Community Association Annual Housing Tour. This was an event that was hosted some years ago. I think the archives, probably the last, may have been 20 years. I think the last time I, I saw it might have been 2004 that I this event thought, yeah. was done. And it was done on 51st Boulevard. Yeah, and, you're right. You're right. Yep. And so those are some of the brochures I found as well as one from 1999. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yep. I'm really trying to bring, you know, bring this uh, whole event full circle because we have beautiful housing stock in Sherman Park. And I think it would be wonderful for people to come see it. Um, our tickets for general admission, which includes also the scavenger hunt is $25. If you just want to do scavenger hunt, it's $15. So um, you all can participate. Our tickets are available on Eventbrite. You can also find them on our website at www.shermanpark.org uh, forward slash event forward slash home dash tours dash 2023. So um, that's how you can find um, the information on our website as well. Um, if you do have any questions, too, you can go to my email. It's MabelL at ShermanPark.org and send me a message. So with all that said, um, are there any other questions, things to think about? Because um, if not, we'll see you at our November webinar. And I'm not sure I remember which one that's going to be. Is that the one on solar? Yes. The 16th. All right. 16th. 16th. So that's November 16th. Yep. Going to be our solar power hour. And that's going to be hosted with the help of the Environmental Collaboration Office mm -hmm. through the city of Milwaukee. So um, hopefully you all will be able to join us then too. So with that being said, we are signing off. Enjoy your evening and stay green. Yes, that's true. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Laura. Good job tonight.